Hello world, welcome back to Golf Subpar with Colt Nost and Drew Stoltz. The 150th Open Championship is in the books, and Cam Smith is the champion golfer of the year. Sleaze, the man had a rather hot putter on Sunday, en route to a final round 64 to beat Cameron Young by one and Rory McIlroy by two. That, it was a hell of a show, man. I loved watching it. It was rock hard out there. I know they didn't get the win they wanted, but man, it was fun to watch. Yeah, a little disappointed they didn't get some conditions that we see at open, like the sideways rain and the wind and things like that. But I mean, you look at that leaderboard at the end of the week, that's a hell of a leaderboard. I mean, you saw Roy McIlroy in the final round putting from 56 yards, I believe, off the green. Like you just see shots you don't see every day. I love Lynx golf. It's beautiful. I would have I would have liked to not see 20 under win, but it is what it is. You give these guys, you know, pretty calm conditions. Um, that's what they're going to do. And I mean, Cam Smith, it looked like Rory's, you know, to lose. And he didn't necessarily go out and lose it. Cam Smith just opens up the back nine with a little pink panther coming around that bitch. And all of a sudden, Rory was coming from behind. It was crazy turnaround. Cam made virtually everything he needed to. And on the flip side, Rory didn't make a whole lot. And he didn't give himself a ton of great looks. It was a lot of 25, 30 footers. You're not going to make a ton of those. But the short ones he did have, Colt, he, he missed those. And he just got clipped by one of the great final rounds you're going to see in major championship. Yeah, I mean, he said, Rory said after the after the round on Sunday, he's like, look, I didn't do anything wrong. I just didn't do a whole lot right. Um, he went bogey-free, 16 pars, two birdies. At the end of the day, he got beat by a historic round of golf. I mean, Cam Smith shooting 64 at the old course on Sunday. It, it's special, man. And this guy, he has been playing some incredible golf. It's his third win of the season to go along with the players in the Tournament of Champions. He's a big-time player. I mean, his caddy, Sammy Pinner, in an interview afterwards, they said, tell us about him. He goes, the man's got a large set of balls. Like, he just... He makes all the clutch putts when you have to. It's it's fun to watch, man. And, you know, there's all this talk. I mean, the guy didn't even get to get through his press conference without Liv getting brought up. And, you know, there's the rumors going around about him. I hope to God it's not true because Cam Smith is a star in the making. He's number two in the world now. He's just a normal dude. All he wants to do is fill up the Claret Jug with as many beers as possible and, and have himself a day. And I hope he's not leaving, man, because I think that will be a big loss for the PGA Tour. He is a special player. Shit, that'd be one of the young. I mean, that's what they need on that tour is youth. They need some young guys. They got no problem getting the forty plus guys to come over there. But what can you do in the twenties? Cam Smith is is launched himself into the, you know the top tier in terms of players in the world, and that would be a big lot. But just looking at that interview, I thought it was shit that he couldn't get through that thing and just you know bask in the glory of having just won the Open Championship at St Andrews. I know that question's got to get asked. I just don't think that. No, was it the doesn't. For it. I totally disagree. At like in that point, situation. Now, in not that yeah, situation. What I'm saying, not in that situation. I said in his post, yeah. in his champion, you know, post conference, championship post conference. Like that ain't the time for it. That's something you ask next time he tees it up on a Tuesday or whatever. Yes. Like, that's when that comes up. Not on the Sunday, ten minutes after he just hit the winning putt at the Open Championship. Compl I, I totally agree. That's why I think that's not the time to ask that question. Uh, it's going to be asked, and it's going to be asked by all these guys that are, are needle movers. Inevitably, that's going to happen. That wasn't the time for it, but the response to it. Didn't give you a whole lot of, I don't think, reasons to no, be it optimistic about it. It sounded a lot like some of the other dudes that have given a similar answer, and then a few weeks later, boom, they're gone. I don't think Cam Smith leaves that early. I think he, at, at worst, rides out the rest of the year. I'm not even saying he's gone, but it wasn't um, leave a whole lot of room for optimism there. If I was Cam Smith, I would have grabbed that Claret Jug, put it right in front of me, and said, next question. Like, I'm not answering this right now. This is the greatest moment of my golfing life. I'm We're not talking about this. This is about me winning at St. Andrews, the 150th Open Championship. This isn't about Liv. That was, I'm not sure who it was that asked. I really frown upon him doing that. It just, it, it wasn't the it time. Wasn't the time. At the end of the day, it wasn't the time no. for it at all. Let him, let him soak that up, dude. That's a, it's going to be his best memory in golf at the end of his career when he's done. He's going to be like, that Masters I want, or that, excuse me, that Open Championship I want at St. Andrews. That's it. Don't blow up. Don't blow it up and ruin the whole mood with that question there. Just wait on that for a little bit. But yeah, the answer was um, he said a lot without saying much at all. Yeah, but man, it was it was awesome to watch. And then I loved seeing him get on the plane to go home, trying to put the claret jug in the overhead compartment. I, I don't blame him for not wanting to check the bags the way the airlines have been lately. They could have just lost that thing for a few months. But uh, pretty cool to see him just flying home commercially with the claret jug. Yeah. I don't blame him one bit. I mean, hearing what, what what Shane Bacon and some of these other dudes went through, you check that thing, some random stranger might just walk up in a few days be like, oh, yeah, I see that thing that's marked super important. That's mine. I don't have a bag tag or an ID or anything, but just give me that thing. But, yeah, checking it on the way home. He's a beast. He earned it. 
that up and down he had on 17. I thought that's when it was going to get really interesting. That two putt he had from on the road hole was unbelievable. Huge marbles on that putt. And I, a putt I don't think's getting enough credit. That one on 18 from the Valley of yeah. Sin. To get that thing up there dead, like you can two putt it, but to not have to grind over an eight, 10 footer or something like that, to do that in that moment where you can't feel your hands, that was unbelievable. The dude's, the dude's putter is arguably the biggest weapon in golf when it gets going. Maybe that and Rory McIlroy's driver, John Rahm's driver, something like that. It's, it's lethal. It is. The guy's a superstar, no doubt about it. Up to number two in the official world golf rankings. And we mentioned the live. We might as well just throw it out there as well. Some big news that just happened this week. David Faraday announcing that he is leaving NBC to go over to live. Listen, I love David Faraday. One of my favorite people. I, I honestly think he changed golf television along with Gary McCord, making it fun, making it entertaining. Um, I know he hasn't been the happiest over at NBC, but this one really shocked me, Sleaze. With everything that this tour is all about and the people that are backing it. And I know David Faraday's relationship with our troops in America. I mean, he, he, you know, he's from Ireland, but he is a proud American citizen. I, I was a little shocked by this, honestly. Yeah. You know, well, bad news. There goes my show with McCord and Faraday, by the way. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> there goes some of my uh, income. No big deal. Thanks, Dose. We'll just go ahead. And uh, that was short lived there, but yeah, I, you know, being on text with David and so you can kind of read between the lines and I'm, I am, I'm very surprised that it came out at this point. I thought if anything, it was maybe down the road and I didn't even think it was a definite yes, but I mean, this is a, this is a big haul for live. This is one of the guys that kind of moves the needles, a needle as far as broadcasters go. Then on top of that, they got a meeting this week with Charles Barkley, who people tend to gravitate towards. They pretty much like to be a part of anything that Charles is on, whether it's DNC, uh, the basketball, and now he's going to maybe go to golf. Like dude, they're, they're making some moves right now. And some of these names that be floating around. It's, becoming a real thing i just hope there's a way it just sucks that it's one or the other right now we're just chopping all the best stuff all the best broadcasters all the best players into two different pots like i think eventually if this the, these dominoes keep falling the way they are they're gonna have to find a way to come together and and, and coexist because it's just if it's truly about like golf and what's good for it like we need these guys to be able to play on both tours and see them as much as we possibly can but it's it's a thing and Faraday Faraday's a blow for sure well we could talk about this for hours i just don't see a point with all the guaranteed money from live how they could ever coexist because you're not giving some some guy nine figures over a hundred million dollars and telling him he can pick and choose his schedule and play where he wants like that's just not going to happen they're going to require you to play all of these events and then you want to play the majors and as we know the top guys they don't like playing more than about 20 events a year that's just how it is so i don't see the day listen i i hate talking about this stuff but it is in the golf news and we have to address it so it is what it is. There's going to be a lot more coming. Trust me. After these playoffs, I think we're going to see Wait, a lot yeah. of movement. Yeah. It's going to be weird. But Wait. this past weekend's tournament is over, and a new champion has been crowned at St. Andrews. As the winner's name is written in history, Dewar sends its warmest congratulations to Cam Smith. Dewar's also has an appreciation for victory as the world's most awarded blended scotch whiskey. Score a win for yourself by teeing up a glass of Dewar's 15, 18, or 21-year-old or the Dewar's 2022 19-year-old Champions Edition, made in partnership with the USGA. Each one was crafted by four-time Master Blender of the Year, Stephanie McClude, at the Dewar's Distillery in Aberfeldy, right up the road from St. Andrews, which makes every tea box and every bottle of Dewar's a great way to celebrate everything Scotland has to offer. Enjoy responsibly. It is time now for the Dewar's Cheers Moment of the Week, Sleaze. And I'm going to give a big shout out to the man who finished third place, Rory McIlroy, because I know his heart was ripped out when he didn't hoist the Claret Jug there at St. Andrews. He was the tournament favorite going in. The whole, everyone in the gallery was out there pulling for him. I feel like most of the golf world was pulling for him and he didn't get the job done. But at the end of the day, he went up there, he faced the music, did his interview and was open, was honest. And I thought that took a lot. And I just, it shows how classy Rory McIlroy is. As a player, you don't have to do those interviews, but Rory did it, and I know it was hard for him, but he went up there, and he was fantastic, and it just shows why he's one of the best dudes in the game. He did it. He didn't have to do it, and all he did was heap praise on Cam Smith. That's hard to do when you just had your guts ripped out of your heart, whether you want to – out of your stomach, whether you want to admit to it or not. That's a hard thing to do, uh, and it was all class. I'll give you my doer's moment of the week. Hold him up here in Flagstaff playing a little golf. I'm going to be up here for a few weeks out at Pine Canyon. Shout out Pine Canyon. My first round, Colt. Play with our our boy and former subpar guest, Derek Anderson. We got a little money game going, but it's nothing crazy. We got a five-some out there. With like four holes left, I could see DA, like DA stops, 
talking as much. And he's getting real serious and he's spending a lot of time over all his shots. And we're riding scooter. I'm like, dude, hurry up, like hit. What are you doing? Like, let's get this thing moving. He's grinding these four and five footers out, reading them from both sides and all this stuff. Finally, we get to the 18th hole. He runs like a 30 footer, like four feet by, takes forever. Finally knocks it in the hole. And I'm like, dude, what are you, what, this means nothing. Like it's for 20 bucks. You know, there's like, it's not even big money game or whatever. And he's like, dude, that's my second ever bogey free round in my life. He's like, I was freaking out for like the last four holes. And he was, he was like, this is like bigger than making a hole in one for me, dude. You don't understand how hard I've been working and all this stuff. So shout out to DA, our boy for his second ever bogey free round in his life. Derek Anderson. Awesome. Hope you posted it. Get that handicap down for when I come up to Pine Canyon. I love it. Also give a little shout out to our guy, Ches Reavy. Another win for golf sub bar. Picked up his third PGA tour win at the Barracuda championship. Really, really cool to see. But it's now time to get to our interview. And we got a man. He's been at the top of the golf. He's seen the highs. He's seen the lows. It's been a very interesting career for our guest this week, Hunter Mayhan. The man's played Ryder Cup, President's Cup, you know, contended in major championships, won on the PGA Tour, and now has stepped away from the game. It's quite the story. Yeah, dude. He's a fun one to talk to. Like you said, I think he's had, you know, relatively close in a few different weeks. We've had two guys that I think that have had the most pressure you can have on them in golf, Ernie Els you know, playing at that President's Cup against Tiger Woods for all the marbles, representing the entire internationals. And now we got Hunter Mahan, who was in that final pair, you know, the, the ultimately the match that it came down to at the Ryder Cup for all the marble. I use, there's not many guys that have had those experiences. We've got two of them relatively close to each other. All right. Well, before we get to Hunter Mahan, please tell me a little bit about rock form. Our boys are back, BG. What else do we need to say? Everybody knows it's ever listened to us. This is the best speaker in the business. I use it. Colt uses it. Dude, I had two linked up on the same golf cart this weekend for maybe the second time ever. It is unbelievable. But as you know, the powerful magnets, grab the cart. There ain't nothing getting those things off of there. You don't need clamps. You just stick it to the cart and go. The sound is incredible. It's waterproof, transfusion proof, drink proof. Colt, I've dropped this thing before. Don't even worry about it. The thing is bulletproof. And also the battery life, dude, you play around a golf, throw it in your bag, forget about it for a week or whatever, come back, the thing's still thumping. It is. The battery life's the best part about it. It is awesome. I mean, there's no other speaker you should be using on the golf course than Rock Rockform. Rockform also makes phone cases with built-in magnets so you can stick your phone to the golf cart. They are super protective and convenient with the magnets. Go to rockform.com and get 25% off using code SUBPAR. Again, that's rockform, R O K form.com and get 25% off using code subpar. All right, here's Hunter Mahan on golf subpar. Okay. The man with us here today has been making tweeters since he was in diapers. He's got over 450 starts on the PGA tour, six wins, been a member of seven team events for the United States. Just a flusher of the golf ball. Hunter Mahan. Good to have you, bud. Well, thank you for having me guys. I'm looking uh, forward to it. Yeah, Hunter, it's been a while. Good to see you. Looking forward to this. Uh, let's give the people a little update. What do you What do you do now? I know you haven't played on the PGA Tour since Minnesota last year. What do you mean? Yeah. What do you got going on? Yeah, I just been home. I kind of um, a good way to say it is I hit my uh, end of my golfing journey. I just was tired of traveling and tired of playing golf, and I said, you know, I got it. I'm completely burnt out on anything creative and trying to go to the range and trying to be the best I could be. I just kind of hit the end of the road with that and needed to be home and, and with my family. And it's um, been a great journey. We've had some unfortunate hard times um, at home, but we've kind of gotten through that. And um, I'm really excited about what's coming ahead for me and looking forward to um, different opportunities. I've been kind of hitting the, um, the phones and talking to a lot of people the last few weeks, trying to figure out, uh, what I can be passionate about, what I want to do. Um, it's something going to be in golf and, and hopefully maybe turn into sports eventually. But um, I'm excited about life again and, and excited about um, finding something I'm really passionate about. I'm going to uh, dive into and, and hopefully be, um, you know, still on golf and just in a different way. That's a that's a hell of a tease there. You want to yeah, give us any sort anything? of a little no, you know, that, that's... peek behind the curtain or do you know what it is? I do not. I do not know what it is. It's just been a lot of fun, and, and um, it's just been fun to be excited about something again, and kind of interested in different aspects of golf um, from like a media side, I guess. But I just don't know where that is yet. Uh, but the good thing is, and the exciting thing is, I think there's a lot of opportunity uh, within the media side of golf, 
um, that isn't being explored. And so I don't know what that is, but I am excited to, you know, I don't want to say the same word again, but explore it and, and yeah. find out where I could fit, but also just be passionate about it and really dig into it and kind of maybe show a content from a different side and a different perspective. I mean, don't, you're, don't you're, do a podcast. Yeah, don't do <laughs> anything a podcast. but podcasts are shit. I'd stay away from that, but go somewhere. <laughs> but no, for, for a guy who's been competing in golf your whole life, like, right. do you miss it at all? No, I actually don't. And I think the reason is, is I just been doing it for so long. I'm, I want to enjoy watching golf. Like I really enjoyed watching the U S open and not feeling like, man, I wish I was there and I wish I was competing and, and those guys suck and you know, I could beat them. It was <laughs> like, I can sit back and just watch it and enjoy it and enjoy um, the shot that Matthew Fitzpatrick hit out of the bunker on 18 to win that thing. And, you know, I could feel what Lily Zaltoris was feeling when he missed that putt. And, and you know, it, it's um, just watching it from a different perspective. I can start to enjoy it and appreciate the guys for the successes and feel, you know, the, the heartbreak for Willie. And, and um, I just feel it from a different side. And I am enjoying that again. And I'm enjoying that part of golf. And it just I think when you're competing, competing, competing against players, um, it just gets it just felt like it was. Not that it was poisoning me or something, but I just want to enjoy the game and enjoy watching and enjoy the players for what they do. And it's been fun to kind of witness and see. And uh, it's just been cool to kind of take it from a different perspective. It, was there a specific moment you said, I'm, I'm done with my journey in golf? But there's a specific moment you can pinpoint where you were out practicing or hitting balls or at a tournament and you were just like, dude, I nope, I'm done. Like this, I don't, I don't, just don't have the desire anymore. Um, I, I woke up in the hotel in Minnesota and I looked around and I said, I've had a really amazing career and I'm just sort of done living this life. I have options to be home with my family and wake up and see my kids in the morning and take them to school and, and be a part of that. And I, it just was one too many hotel rooms and golf is a beautiful sport. And I actually enjoyed playing, but it was the day to day stuff that I just couldn't put all I had into it. And if you want to compete on the PGA Tour against these great players, you better be all in and you better be focused on it because those guys are doing those things. And there's a bunch of new players coming up. And I just hit my road and I said, I, I just can't do this anymore. And I just need to do something else. Um, but lucky for me, I've had a great career, um, earned a great living, great opportunities. Um, golf has given me so, so much. Um, I'm just uh, looking forward to it from taking it from a different you know, angle. How often you play in nowadays? I've played like four or five rounds since then. Oh, wow. So oh, not very much. Not a lot. Yeah, I haven't hit balls once. Um, I've just been like immersed into my kid's life and, and being a dad and being a husband and just doing that. And that's kind of where my focus has been. In the last probably couple months, I've started to explore different things, what I want to do um, and, and trying to figure that out and and um make sure whatever i do next i really want to be fully engaged in that and, and give it sort of my best effort well let's let's go back to the, the early years of hunter mayhem because i mean you were a superstar from the second you picked up a golf club i mean ajga player of the year u.s junior champ runner up in the usam but you started out your college career at usc yeah. you had a great year and then you decided to transfer to oklahoma state what brought that about um it just wasn't the right fit for me i knew when i was there it just I wasn't going to be the, become the best golfer that I was going to be. I felt like I needed a little bit more uh, structure. I felt like I was almost too young to be put in that situation where I can just, in a weird way, make my own decisions and and kind of plow through it. It wasn't a great – I didn't love the environment that we were in. It was sort of hard to go practice. We were in the middle of L.A. to go hit balls or go chip somewhere. I mean, it was like a whole ordeal. It's going to take you 30-plus minutes to get there. Then I had to be back for um, tutoring and classes. It was just like, man, this is really a hard work just to be able to play golf and go to school and then try to have a good time. And it just wasn't the right environment. And I kind of knew that pretty quickly. Oklahoma State being in Stillwater, having an incredible tradition. Um, Coach Mike Holder was exactly what I needed at that time. And to be in that environment where everything was about golf and being the best golfer that you could be kind of every second of the day was what I still needed. I still needed to mature quite a bit. And so it was honestly a really easy decision. Um, 
And it was challenging. It was tough to leave Southern Cal. Made some great friends with all the guys on the team. And it was, like I said, it, that was a lot of fun. I really enjoy the players and I really enjoy the, the school and, and, you know, going to the football games and stuff. But from a golfing for my career, what I needed to do, I needed to get out of there and, and go to Oklahoma State. You just needed to get the shit scared out of you by Coach Holder. I get it. Perfect. Every second. Every second. <laughs> there wasn't enough day. fear. That guy I still needed, terrifies I me. needed but, more but, fear in my life. Oh, at that I mean, an 18-year-old kid, I didn't, 19, I mean, I didn't know, you know, you kind of think you know, you kind of think, oh, I'm going to go there, I'm going to change this team, or we're going to go to Nationals, and we're going to be great, and this is, you know, we can ch- do this, and it was like, we didn't make it to Nationals my first year there, we were not focused and not very good, and I was like, man, this is, this is a different than what I expected, and, and sort of what I wanted, and like I said, it was easy to go to Oklahoma State, because that's, I sort of needed to kind of get refocused, um, and get back at it and start to work. Yeah, Holder can do that to a man or to a kid. But you're one of the few guys, Hunter, I think I can only think of like a handful really that won at every single, like dominated at every level. You won the Junior Am. You were the best player in college, you know, throughout. Then you win the Hogan Award. Then you get right on tour and you start winning out there. Until, rewind like a handful of years ago, did golf always just feel easy to you? Because you really never ran into any stretches where you weren't winning stuff. No, I I ran into like mini stretches. And maybe it wasn't long, but... I remember I, I felt like when I was a junior golfer, when I first started playing tournaments, I was in California. I didn't win anything. I mean, those kids were really good. I moved to Texas. All of a sudden, started playing junior stuff, got a little bit older, maybe a little bit bigger, um, got to AJJ, started, started winning and, and getting some success. Went to Southern Cal, uh, won two tournaments in the fall. And then I kind of, I did, like I said, I didn't feel at home. I didn't feel like this was a good place for me. My game, I didn't have, I had an okay spring. But then I didn't have a great little summer. I was I was definitely trending in the wrong direction for sort of a few months there. I got to Stillwater. I was not doing great. I mean, I got there. I think I shot um, high 80s in a in a in a qualifying round. I mean, it was really bad, and I was really I was losing my mind. And That's Karsten Creek. Karsten fault. will do that to <laughs> well, a man if you ain't clicking. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I mean, I played it. It's so much easier now than it was back then. By the way, any, I mean, it's it's pathetic. What it is, it's not what it used to be. <laughs> but but I got off the course, and I was, I mean, I was kind of lost. I was really spinning, and I just like left eighteen. I told Holder I shot like eighty seven or something, and I went to like the Chipping Green or the range or something, and he followed me. And Mike McGraw followed me. Coach McGraw from Baylor followed me. Mm-hmm. And we kind of sat down and had a little powwow and just, I needed to be told, like, you know, you are, what you're doing right now is just complete garbage. This is not what you are capable of. This is not what Oklahoma State puts out there um, from a person perspective, from a golfer perspective. You need to do better. We are going to ride this ship. Um, he, took me to the first tournament he didn't i should he shouldn't have like i didn't qualify but he's like we had a really small team um we were really really young i think we had like anders holtman and then like a bunch of freshmen and like a sophomore too um but he kind of believed in me kind of instilled that and he still structure into my life and into my golfing career and then started to go from there uh really well but that was i mean that was a Say it was a speed bumper. It wasn't great. Is is an understatement at that time. Um, and then I went on tour, um, got my car through Q school, but then I lost it. And then I had to go back to Q school. And then it, I, after that, I started to go again. And, and, and John Wood got on the bag with me. I think he helped me a ton. Um, and things started to go. So I've had like I had like little mini. They weren't long stretches, but they were definitely stretches where things could have gone sort of awry. And I think I just had good people around me at the time to kind of steer the ship and get us going in the right direction. Before we get back to our interview with Hunter Mahan, I want to tell you a little bit about TaylorMade. High bombs, low cutters, flighted wedges, flop shots to tuck pins. The beauty of golf is that in any given round, you get to play so many different types of shots. That's why you need the ball that's made to be better on every shot in golf, the TP5 and TP5X from TaylorMade. With the TP5 and TP5X, no matter what shot you're facing, you'll have the confidence to step in and think, I love it. Stock fade, love it. Step on a three wood, love it. Knock it down under the wind, I love it. Whatever shot you need to pull off, the TaylorMade TP5 and 5X were made to do it better than any other ball in golf. Whether we're talking about the final round of a major 
or a casual round with your buddies on any given Saturday. That's why players like Dustin Johnson, Roy McIlroy, Colin Morikawa, Ricky Fowler, Tommy Fleetwood, and so many other pros trust TP5 and TP5X every week. Looking for a little more feedback around the greens? Both TP5 and 5X come in picks for better visual feedback around the greens and a little extra flair. So if you want to step into every shot you face and think, I love it, try the most complete ball in golf. Head to tailormadegolf.com and use the promo code SUBPAR for free shipping. Now let's get back to Hunter Mayhem. Seemed like once you got that first win on the PJ Tour in Hartford, things just kind of took off. Yeah. Go to go to that that tournament there because you mentioned John Wood. That was some of the best caddying that I can remember. When y'all were on eighteen, you you weren't one hundred percent sure about the club, but he was. And take yeah. us through that because I mean he he put a lot of confidence in you. I think to make that golf swing on eighteen. Oh, without a doubt, I think caddies are sort of a you know an unsung hero amongst professional golf and. Um, that was a crazy day because I was on the range thinking this is my time. Um, I can do it. I can win. I love the golf course, the Travelers championship, you know, the TPC Cromwell. I think it's turned into one of the better events on tour. I think you've seen that with the fields, even after us opens where guys are completely spent. It's actually a perfect golf course to play in a perfect event to kind of chill out and feel like you can make some birdies again. So I knew I had a chance. I knew I was ready. I felt mentally, physically, everything, I was ready to win. Um, I think we were in good position. We were sort of, I think, in the lead. And then we, I think we bogeyed, I think I three put it like 16 or something, and then bogeyed 17. And I think we ended up being one down, going to 18. Hit a great drive. Um, and we were just, we're sort of, I think, in between clubs. Um, and he's, John was always really good and understanding where I was mentally kind of in the moment. And I think he knew how to talk to me. Um, he was perfect because he was forceful enough. You know, he was saying, he, 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 like, sort of um, La Cava-ish or somebody with, a, with enough brass to say, this is what you need to do, and you can do it, and let's just, this is the club, and be aggressive. Go right at it. And like you said, he instilled that confidence in me in that moment. He knew what to say. And I made a great swing, aggressive, and we hit a great shot. And luckily, we were just a few yards further in the playoff. And I think that confidence from 18, when he said, kind of rolled right into it. And, and he was like, perfect, watch, let's go. And I knew it. And we hit it, you know, stiffed it in there. And we ended up winning. But it, it's a great point. And I, because I would, looking at the um, US Open a few weeks ago with Matthew Patrick and Billy Foster, I thought, boy, I think Billy had a big key for Matthew winning because of, He's been there so many times and was able to just through that middle part of the round where they had the lead and all of a sudden three, late, three holes later, they lost it. I think they were like two back. That's when a good caddy comes into play and starts to give you confidence, ride the ship, get you back focused. Um, you know, those, those little moments you don't see on TV, but those little conversations that, you know, players and caddies have, I mean, can be huge for the outcome events. Yeah, and that was like the jump start to you really starting to play some great golf. But as a guy that was coming out of college with huge expectations from the media, from fans, you won everything, like I was saying. When you get that first win, is it more of like excitement? You're excited to win on the PGA Tour? Or is it almost more of a relief? Like, okay, I did it. I can stop answering all this shit no matter what. I'm a PGA Tour winner now. Yeah, I think I felt lucky that we weren't quite there with maybe social media and everything going on. Um it was definitely, I was just super excited. I, I didn't really feel my relief. I felt proud that I did this and I accomplished this sort of goal and this feat. Um, you know, it's, it's, it was daunting for me to get on tour and to be around the players that I looked up to. Um, I was around Justin Leonard a lot, um, taken from Randy Smith at Royal Oaks. So I kind of been around a few players, but to actually be out there and competing against these guys was big and it was intimidating for a while. And then I started to play and then um, making that first President's Cup team was a huge deal. Getting a call from, you know, Jack Nicholas, captain, saying that I'm going to be a part of the team was amazing. Uh, but I still went through those little bumps of like, do I still belong here? Do I still belong on a team of this caliber with all these great players? Um, it took, you know, you get through that and then you feel like you do. And so um, it was, it took a little time for me to really feel like, I'm a part of the tour. I know what to do. I know how to win out here. I know I could be against really anybody. Yeah, well, you, you damn sure got comfortable and went on an incredible run. I mean, you made eight straight tour championships, 
like you said, President's Cup, Ryder Cup. And I think those are some of our favorite stories to talk to guys about because the team events, you know, the PGA Tour, it's such an individual sport. You're out there, it can get lonely. But then one week a year, you get to be part of a team. What, what did those weeks mean to you? Those are the weeks that I grew up hoping I could be a part of. I think some guys, majors, champions, whatever, to be – on a President's Cup team, Ryder Cup team, though, that is what I wanted. That that was my dream. And so to be a part of those teams was absolutely the best. Um, it was incredible to see the guys sort of put their guard down um, and you because you weren't competing against each other and you weren't doing separate things all the time. You were all on the same schedule and you were all talking to each other and you're all working with each other to figure out how we can play our very, very best and to win that week. I mean, it, it's the absolute best and is – Everyone has said, once you make one team, you want to be on a mall because it is just so much fun. It's just pure golf um, junkies and they're pure golf enthusiasts, just living sort of the dream and being a part of something sort of bigger than yourself. And that one in 2008, I want to go to that Ryder Cup, the one at Valhalla. That was awesome as a, as a you know, an American. Like yeah. that was, that's one of the ones that I think of the first, you know, because it hadn't been done in a long time. But is that, Looking back on it now, do you think that is your is that your most memorable experience as a professional golfer that week? Uh, probably, probably. We were on such – it's something that I look back on and thinking, wow, I was a part of that because we were on such a rough patch and yeah. it, it just felt so stale, the Ryder Cup, in a weird way. Like it was – we weren't really playing that well as a team for some reason – those guys were getting peppered with questions. Why is it, why aren't you winning? You're better than they are. Why are they winning? It was just, and it felt like it was for a really long time. Like since almost felt like the nineties through two thousands, like it was almost shocking that the U S would win because Europe just dominated and they had this momentum and it just kept rolling over and over. And they were so confident. I mean, they had, it felt like they had teams set up for 15 years of just guys who, who were playing together. And we had to hear about how great their, um, team chemistry was and how close they were and the U S is fragmented and, you know, Tiger's not a good cat. Tiger's not a good, you know, team player. Phil's doing his own thing and everyone's, you know, you guys just don't have what they have. And so I think Paul took that as a real challenge and he really gave the team a lot of um, power and, and really made the guys who the, the eight guys, he said he wanted more captain's pick. So he, the eight guys were and the captain were really, one and they are one thinking unit to try to figure out how do we do our very very best how to become a unit without you know you know, through 12 guys because it's sort of impossible and so he had the brilliant idea of just let's just make it a little bit smaller so these guys aren't trying to figure out how they can be together one through 12 but they can just be a small unit and to know that they're going to play together and so there's just less to think about and you can just go out there and play and um, obviously, it worked to perfection, um, and it was just so much fun. I mean, just to, you know, Paul, I remember, you know, he's driving in the fairway, and he gets on the cart, and he's just pumping up the crowd like this, you know, <laughs> like it's a football game or something. You know, it was completely different um, than anything we've ever really seen before, and I think that has, you know, s- spurned and, and spawned the Ryder Cup hysteria that exists today that is just so awesome to see that it's really one of the biggest events um, in sport. Yeah, we got to go to our first one this past year at Whistling Straits. And be, being on that first tee Friday was just, the atmosphere was unbelievable. But, you know, back in 2008, one guy that really got the crowd going that doesn't play golf anymore is Anthony Kim. Yeah. And, I mean, Sleaze and I have both played golf with him. I've been around him a ton. For the people out there that never really got to see Anthony Kim play, I mean, how good was this guy? And what was he like being on a team with him that week? Oh, it's hard to tell people how good he was. He's really good, really, really talented. He had a really amazing blend of um, technique that was excellent. Um, his swing was fantastic. Short game was great. Um, sort of a streaky putter, but his technique and ball striking was so good, and he was so consistent. Um, and he was never afraid of competition. He was super competitive when you got a, when you got him on the golf course. Um, he really wanted to beat your brains in like he really enjoyed just beating you. There was a sort of a tiger thing to him of, you know, he was not afraid of competition from anybody. Um, what was the next part of your question? I forgot. Just like, what was it like him being on the team? Being Cause I mean, he's oh. got the belt buckle. He's going crazy. He beat Sergio. Doesn't even yes. know he won. Yeah. <laughs> like, it just keeps yeah. going. <laughs> I think that was, um, 
we had such a fun mix of players that week and he was part of that fun mix and Paul did a great job of letting Anthony sort of be Anthony and he wasn't going to try to corral him and try to bring him in and say, well, you've got to be one of 12 and you have to be a part of the team. And he just let everyone be who they were. And just Anthony was just going to be Anthony. Anthony was going to have fun to be the best of Anthony. You just had to let him sort of roll and put him with Phil, which was great because they can kind of go back and forth and banter with each other Um, and just let him, you know, have fun and enjoy the experience and Paul was the perfect person for Anthony to kind of, uh, you know, feel that fire that Anthony has and put him as soon as like, I think we all knew it, we were all praying that he'd get Sergio because that was just going to be the perfect pairing because yeah. Anthony wanted a big piece of him and, and we all hoped <laughs> he would get it. And especially after Saturday, Saturday, because Anthony and I were supposed to play Saturday afternoon and Phil and Justin were going to rest. Anthony had a terrible, but awful Saturday morning. I mean, they, we had to bench him. Because Phil was not really wanting to play five matches, um, so Phil had to play in the afternoon. So Phil, so so Anthony was pretty fired up. I mean, he was really fired up to go out and play somebody. And luckily, we got Sergio. And I think we all knew, you know, if we could have gone to you know some sports book and put a lot of money, Anthony, we all would have done. <laughs> and obviously, he went out there and just proved it. So that's how that that uh, matchup or that pairing between you and Phil came to me because you and Justin Leonard were going out earlier that week and you guys yeah. were beating everybody more or less and having a great run and then I remember yeah. you got paired up with Phil so that wasn't that wasn't always part of the plan for I you to go with Phil that afternoon it was just because Anthony played bad and then it had to kind of adapt on the fly. Yeah, I think that was um, Paul had all the kind of history of of guys with five matches and it's not great when they go into singles um such an emotional week so i think he definitely one of the young guys me and him it's going to be just best ball to go out there and and play since we were going to have i mean since we were always we were just in our 20s and we were you know we didn't want to say we just want to go play and compete and so um and anthony was kind of streaky that week and he just had a bad morning just whatever it was but obviously he fixed it um phil and i got i think a half um and that afternoon and like we said it I think we all knew Anthony was going to go out and be really, really good. And he just needed a break. He just needed a moment to kind of, sometimes you need that. Sometimes you need that little session off to kind of get back because that week happens so fast. And when you get going good, it's great. But you, when you kind of get sideways, there's so much going on. It, you just kind of need a moment to relax and maybe go hit balls because you sort of are out of your comfort zone a little bit and you are out of your routine. And so it's, it's, it's a lot you know, that, that Ryder Cup week, there's a lot going on. So it was fun to, you know, have the result we did though. Yeah, there is a, a lot going on and it's, it can't be easy, especially, I mean, the pressure is as high as it's going to be in the game of golf. Uh, we got to talk a little bit about 2010 at Celtic Manor because not these, these matches, they're close a lot of times, but not often does it come down to the last match yeah. for the entire thing. And there you are, you're in the anchor match against Graham McDowell. I mean, can, as a guy, we have no idea what that's going to be like. What, what that feels like. Yeah, Where does, does those nerves like rank for you? Knowing that you're the anchor match, you know, it might not even get to you depending on how yeah. the other matches go. But when it, when it comes down to it there and, and the matches are starting in and you're like, okay, this is probably going to come down to my match. It's very, very strange to tee off and there's really no one around and everything is out in front of you and you can kind of see what's going on. Um, it was really strange playing the first few holes because you know how important it is. But then at the same time, there's really no one, I'd say no one's out there. There's not many people, you know, you've got Tiger out there, you got Phil out there and you got Ricky's out there playing and Rory. And, and so there's so much going on. And then by every hole you're playing, it, it's, you're kind of seeing what's happening on the board and, and, you know, things are changing. And then by that, you know, we're kind of making the turn. It was, it was like a storm coming over the horizon and you can kind of see it coming all of a sudden it's just the impact what's going on and how the masses are sort of ending up you can tell that like it might come down to you and we we're it's strange to have the last match usually it's maybe you know that match gets done early or something but we were like we were the only ones out there and all this stuff's coming i mean it's like all of a sudden everything's on top of you all the guys on the team the wives everywhere it's just on top of you and it's wild and it was I mean, it was intense. It was really, really intense. And it was, um, um, you just knew, you know, if we didn't win what was going to happen. It was just going to be a sea of people on top of you. And that's mm-hmm. sort of what happened. And it was crazy. It was really, really crazy. And it was intense. And it was like, you know, I got to give credit to Graham was 
Graham McDowell is one of my favorite people. He's just a great, great human being. Um, I know he felt, you know, someone was going to lose and someone was going to feel terrible, but he was a great guy. He said some beautiful words. Um, but what was cool was like, Corey came to me right away, looked at me in the eyes, like, you know, it was so intense and so emotional at that time. He told me how proud of um, he was of me. And then Tiger walked me from like literally 17 all the way to the clubhouse. He was the first guy to give me a hug. He told me how proud he was of me. And he said, we came here as a team. We're going to leave here as a team. No one person lost this thing. So he was super into my feelings and, and how I felt. Cause I was like crying there in the locker room. I was so devastated by what happened. Um, but that was neat. I, I always felt that I always felt his energy with me the whole time. Cause he was with me every single step, um, you know, protecting me in a way. And so it was cool. It was cool to see, you know, an aftermath going into um, press room. Phil was there with me. He, he sat right next to me. He wanted to take questions. So it was, I think that was, um, it was really truthful to see the team and how close we were and how unfair it was, how people have kind of talked about the American team for so many years. No doubt. I mean, can you, those nerves coming down the stretch with all, with everybody out there watching and it's just y'all on the golf course. Can you compare that to anything else in your golf career? No, there's nothing like that. There's nothing like that. There's, there's not a moment where there's one side against the other. Yeah. You go out and watch That's the crazy. golf. You're watching everybody. You're, 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 enjoying what's happening you're enjoying the great shots and um you know uh neil smith told me he was my psychologist for a long time he said you know he's walking out with the fans watching you know me or his clients play he says people want to see great shots or horrible shots hitting a really good smart shot no one really cares about you know hitting the flag making something incredible but shaking it hitting it awful that's actually <laughs> as exciting as hitting it stiff so people want to see both. They don't, you know, he's like, it's kind of funny when you hear people talk about things. And, and uh, so that, that's, that perspective has always kind of made me actually feel good in a way. Well, you're one of the only guys that's ever been in that situation. We just had Ernie Els on the show recently and talked about that President's Cup where it came down to he and Tiger at the end. And mm, he was just talking about, yeah. dude, I couldn't even like feel my hand like that. Yeah. And he's won major championships yeah. and everything. There's not many people in the history of golf that have been the, you know, in that situation like you've been in. But when you got into that press conference and clearly – you're going to be choked up. That's a big moment, all that. And then Phil kind of like took over as, as yeah. you were fielding questions. What do you remember most about that? I thought that was cool, Phil, to like, you know, I know it's popular to kind of drag him right now, but I thought that was a cool moment sticking up for his team the way he did. Yeah, I I, I physically, I, I can't say anything bad about Phil. I know what's going on in that side of his world right now, but, you know, I, I've, I had always amazing experiences with, with Phil. He was one of the first guys to call me when I turned pro. We played together, uh, I think, at Oakland Hills when I, you know, first turned pro. And so he's been with me. I've talked to him about multiple things outside of golf. He's given me life advice on many different things. Um, invited us over for dinner, him and his wife. I mean, I, mean, I just I physically can't say anything bad about the guy. He's just been so lovely to me and um, been a great friend, someone who always picks up the phone if I have a question about a lot of different things. So um, it's crazy to see what sort of happened and where his – um, career is, I guess, at the moment. Um, so him doing that, I mean, he was prepared to do that. I mean, he, I could tell that he was ready to jump on that moment if I couldn't answer questions or, you know, didn't have really anything to say. So I've always been super um, uh, proud of our relationship and happy to call him a friend and um, thankful for him to be there for me during that moment. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. That was a really, really cool moment. But, you know, now that you've removed yourself from competitive golf, with everything that's going on, give us Hunter Mahan's opinion. You know, live tour versus the PGA tour. Do you think this competition's good for golf? Do you do you hate it? Give us Hunter Mahan's opinion. Yeah, Hunter. Dig in here, bud. <laughs> um, you guys are breaking up. I can't hear you. What was <laughs> it, it, uh, it's crazy. I've spent um hours talking about it with different people to come up with some sort of opinion or idea about what's going on. It's so unprecedented that a major sport um, organization is being challenged. It's pretty wild. It's pretty crazy. Um, I guess what's crazy is we've heard about this for a really long time. This is not something that came up out of nowhere. It's years sort of been in the making. Um, I think the PGA Tour probably just didn't expect it to actually happen that uh, another organization would come about and actually take players the way they are um, and sort of in the manner that's that's happening. Um, 
the players are sort of being the ones winning in this situation. Um, you know, the, the Oklahoma State amateur, um, Eugenio just accepted mm-hmm. um, a, a contract from them. He's going to play the live tour. He's got, um, you know, probably generational money. And how can I blame? How can I sit there and tell him, no, you're not allowed to take that. It's ridiculous. That's what we live in with options. And so, um, you know, I, it's, you know, I think Liv probably had a pretty good week. Brooks Kopka's kind of a big thing, a big deal. You know, you're going to have uh, Bryson show up. That's, that's a really big deal. I mean, um, the players that they're getting slowly but surely, like Carlos Ortiz is, I think he's he's a star in waiting. Maybe I, I, I you know I think maybe his best golf hasn't come yet. Uh, Matthew Wolf is a brand name. His best golf probably has is still in front of him. So um, it, it's hard to say what's good for the game. I think that's a weird question. Um, what is golf game professional golf? I don't know who controls that. I don't know. There's so many tours. It's hard to figure out who's in charge of this. And um, you know I'm a little. You're a little worried about the fans. Or are we not going to see these great players competing against each other very much? That's that's sad. I don't want to see that. Um, you know, the majors become, you know, almost more powerful than they ever have because now that's where we're going to see, get to see the best players in the world. Is it only going to be four times a year? Man, that doesn't sound right. Um, but I can't uh, – I think Live Golf, maybe they're sh- maybe shining a light on something that um, – players have an opportunity to get they're they're sort of cashing in on their brands right like dj's created yeah. a brand over time yeah and he gets you have the option as jay said you have the option to become the best player in the world over here and, and still make a ton of money on the pga tour or you can take sort of the guarantee it, it's i think no one's wrong in this situation which is sort of weird to say um i i i heard john rom talk and i thought that was really great and smart passionate about what he believes is professional golf. Rory's talked a lot about it. And, and but then you hear other guys like, this is an incredible opportunity for my family and, and things going forward. I can't argue with that either. It's very, it's a very strange time for golf. Um, but like everyone else, I want to see the best players play against each other. That's the most exciting thing. When I saw the last U S open it was incredible. It was an incredible feeder. I thought it was incredible golf. Um, I'm glad nothing a black cloud wasn't over it. I thought it was just amazing to witness uh, all the players competing. So um, this is far from over like this. There's no, there's no resolution. I don't think that's coming anytime soon. So we'll see, but um, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens, um, you know, in the, in the coming maybe years. Yeah. I'm with, I, I'm with you. Like, I mean, listen, the money's incredible. I, I don't think anyone could ever say, you know, they shouldn't like Dustin Johnson. He doesn't need that money or he, he shouldn't take that money. Like you have right. no idea what you're going to do until $150 million checks put in front of you. Like, I mean, it's, well, just, it's, it's life-changing generational money. But at the same time, like if we only see the best players in the world play against each other four times a year, that, that is going to be sad. Yeah. And, and, you know, Colin Coward had a great quote the other day. He said, it's all the people talking about this. They're the people that haven't been offered this money. Yeah, so exactly. it's hard for you to say that what you wouldn't do or what you would do when it's never been offered to you, you've never had that opportunity. And so there's a reason it's being offered to these guys because they've earned this opportunity. You know, I mean, Justin, Dustin Johnson and Phil Mickelson, they're multiple major winners. They're, you know, they're a lifetime um, members of the PGA tour. I mean, they've earned that. They went and earned that 20 plus wins, um, 10 years of playing. So they earned their opportunities to be on the PGA tour forever. That's going to be hard to say they don't deserve to be on the tour when they do, because they've earned that, that's right. Yep. Yeah, I think that's going to be a sticky thing in terms of that lifetime deal. I also think, Hunter, in my opinion, I think the Masters and Augusta National hold the keys to all this because we've seen the USGA come out and say, all right, you guys, you can play in this year's US Open. We've seen the RNA say, all right, you can play in this year's Open Champion Championship. Augusta hasn't come around yet. And if they come out and say, no, you're not allowed to play, I kind of think the rest of the major championships, those governing bodies all fall in line with what Augusta does. And I, I tend to think that Augusta kind of is the holding the keys to the kingdom here. Whatever they decide, everyone falls in line with. Maybe, but I don't. Is that legal? I don't know. I really, I have no idea from a legal. I don't know if any of this stuff is legal. I guess that'll all shake out. I just feel like from a precedent standpoint, Augusta is kind of the one everyone looks to. I guess so, but it's also, you know, how do you do that? How do you say, well, because you've 
you're not part of the PGA Tour, but you're part of the Asian Tour and you can play, and you're part of the European Tour and you've earned the right to play. You're not a part of the Live Tour, but you have qualified to play, but we're not going to let you play. Like, that's a loss. That's that's a lawsuit, and I don't think they're going to win that. I've talked to quite a few people, and everyone's like, they don't. You can't just do that. You can't tell someone they can't do something. But they've actually earned the right to do it, and it's very. Like I said I like like you guys said. I don't know what the answer is, um, but like I said, I, I want to see the best can play. Um, but this is also sort of what leverage looks like, isn't it? And and free agency. It's sort of uncomfortable. And it's, it's hard to see. We've seen it. We've seen it in all those yeah. sports, right? Like yeah. stoppages, work stoppages. You can't play. You know, MLBs. There's a strike, and these things happen in a lot of other sports. And this is the first time it's happening in golf, and it's it is uncomfortable, and it's it's a weird space to be living in right now. And so, um, I don't know when this is all going to shake out. But the players are definitely the ones benefiting, and it, it's hard to say that's a bad thing, but. I don't know. It, it's really, it's really interesting to see what's sort of happening. And I'm happy for the guys uh, playing on the live tour and I'm happy for the PGA tour players playing for um, making their own choices. And, you know, choices are, you know, usually never a bad thing. No, I think, I think a lot of this is going to depend on what the world golf rankings do as well. Yeah. If they don't get points, then it's going to be tough. Yeah. You're going to have the past masters champions that obviously could still yep. be invited to play the masters. But other than that, I mean, these guys are going to continue to fall down the world rankings, and then you're not going to be eligible to play in them anyway. But I just want what's best for golf. I just, I, I, I know it doesn't happen a ton even before the Live Tour came around, where you get, you know, all top ten in the world at yep. an event. But you still get, like, I mean, this past week we had six of the top ten in the world. Like, that's great for a tournament, and it's fun to watch it, watch these guys battle it out. And I, that's that's something like the Travelers Championship, man, to see what yeah. they've done and what they've created is absolutely amazing, and I'm so proud to be their champion from such a long time ago, but the people there, Nathan Grove and Andy Bissett, the people who have built that event, it's so powerful and it's so amazing what they've done for the community. Um, the PGA Tour is so impactful everywhere they go. And when you get a local sponsor like that, like Travelers is, there's a real effort to make it the very, very best it can be. And you see the players see that and want to be a part of that. And they've turned that event into something really cool and special and super exciting i mean it's really one of the best events that that um, that i see on tour and um, it's always a place that i've enjoyed going to and that you know not playing at that this week definitely i was definitely thinking about it all week because i've had so many great memories and the people there are just absolutely amazing yeah they do a great job with amateurs too. get it like giving yeah. exemptions to top amateurs and those guys remember that after they turn pro and there's somebody's like these guys gave me my first shot i'm coming back that's when you get six of the top 10 the week after a major and it's great to see the younger players. I mean, the PGA Tour is going to have to start really um, yeah. working with the young college players and, and they're going to have to start selling themselves, you know, because Liv's coming and we've already seen that, you know, with um, uh, Eugenio. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, but oh, the number two amateur. Chikara, you just, yeah, we just call him Chikara. 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 I like that yeah. better. And, and, and they're, they're, they're coming after the young guys. James Pyatt. He's on the Liv Tour. You got uh, Chikara's over there. So they're selling themselves to the young players, and the Peter is going to have to do that. And 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 that Pearson Cootie, he already won yep. over the Corn Ferry Tour. If I was the tour, I'm probably going to walk to him and say, "You're on the PJ Tour now. We want you on yep. this tour. You are, uh, you know, you're a badass. We want you on here because you're going to, you are the future of golf. We don't need to go through this whole process. We want you here right now. And and they're going to have to sell themselves to the young college players, sort of like the um, NCA, right? Like that's the feeder." um into the nfl they're yeah. gonna have to start doing that more aggressively i think you got to have a direct path to the pga tour for these college kids like pearson cootie i mean yeah. he turned down multiple multi-million dollar yeah. deal from live because he wants to be on the pga tour but it's like man here i am the number one guy in this pga tour you and i'm going to play the corn Ferry tour i should be getting right to the pga tour i i totally agree and i think they're gonna start doing creative things like that and yep um I mean, he's kind of earned that right, hasn't he? I mean, he was just yeah. kicking, you know, he went to Texas. I won't hold that against him. That's okay. Um, <laughs> but he went up there. I mean, he went up there one right away. He's ready. Put him on the tour. You don't even have to think about it. I agree. My loss. So that's, you know, yeah. they're, and they're going to have to start selling themselves like that and, and make themselves um, be aggressive. They're going to be super aggressive in changing in their, their model because I do think Liv's going to be aggressive in changing. If they don't get rolled off ranking points, 
because they need 72 holes. Well, then you add 72 holes. It's really easy to do. I mean, they need, that is a huge part of this and they need it and they're going to be aggressive in getting it. And so, you know, we'll, we'll, like I said, seems like the players are going to be the ones to benefit. Um, but I hope the game of golf is also going to benefit too. Yeah. Yeah. If you're 21 years old and the two options are $5 million in your bank account or go to Q school. I'm not, I'm not banking my tour on a bunch of 21 year olds saying I'll go to Q school. Yeah. And it's also, it's, it's, it's a strange, you know, um, the only thing I worry about with the young guys is, Hey, you don't really know whatever the goals are, but the tough part is you need to play a lot when you're a young guy to, to really reach the potential you want to, you need to keep playing and keep playing and keep playing. That's why, I, I mean, you know, like I said, I, I would fly right down to, to Pearson and say, you're on tour. I mean, tomorrow be like that. Nah, you've, you've done enough. We get it. You're good. Mm-hmm. You're awesome. You're amazing. We don't need to wait and, and hope you get through the playoffs or whatever. You're, you're good to go, man. You're awesome. Awesome. I, I agree with you. All right. Well, let's get to some fun here. Let's get to the emergency nine. We're going to do nine fun questions to learn just a little bit more about Hunter, Hunter Mayhem. All right. We <laughs> ask this to everybody. You can trade lives with anyone. Why are you smiling? Like, feel because like it's just fun. No, it's <laughs> nothing bad. It's just fun. But you can trade lives with anyone, dead or alive. You, can be, you get to be them for a day. Who would it be? For a day. Oh wow. Um, well, we know you're a huge basketball guy. Just say it. No, no, no. Actually, no. Um, oh, LeBron. Things of God. Out. No. Him. Come on. Okay, I'd probably like to be Michael Jordan good. for a day. I don't think that Michael yeah. Jordan any day in his life would probably be pretty awesome. I don't know what – I mean, he was at NASCAR the other day. Um, probably anything he's doing is probably going to be pretty fun, I'd say. Yes. Hanging out with you at the Ryder Cup, that's a big day. You could hang out with yourself. That would be sick. That would be pretty cool. Why wouldn't it be, you know? <laughs> I mean, it would be weird to be that well-known, right? Everywhere you walk, it's it's you cannot hide. I mean, you're just you're, – you're just the goat of something, you know, of a whole sport, it's pretty wild. Yeah, I, I would be okay with being him for a day. Yeah, right. wouldn't wouldn't um, yeah wouldn't be terrible. All right, next question. I noticed you trimmed up your flow. You used to have the flowing locks going there for a while. Is the reason that you cut that because you're getting too many comparisons to Kenny Powers? Ooh, you know what? Huge missed opportunity. I did a very bad job. I should have had a grown a real mullet. I didn't have a mullet. I just had long hair. It was more Dave Grohl, if I would if I say mm-hmm. so. But I should have. I should have done it in stages and I didn't. And it was a big mistake. So maybe I'll grow it back out and do it right. When did you get rid of it? Um, probably a couple, probably a couple months ago. It was kind of getting a little warmer here and I kind of wussed out basically. It's getting so hot. That's a big moment too. All that dedication and hard work. And then all of a sudden just bam, gone. Years of hard work. I don't know what you're talking about. Colt, uh, yeah, Colt comes <laughs> to tears every time. <laughs> comes to, I should have saved a few locks and sent it to him. If I had hair, it wouldn't be fair, Hunter. That's that's true. Golly. <laughs> I would want to be you then if you had hair. That's what I'd want to be. That's a good day. point. That would have been a very acceptable answer. I wouldn't have minded that at all. True. But you mentioned MJ. I know you're a big fan. Most amount of money you've ever spent on a pair of Jordans. Oh, I spent like five grand. Um, and this was in 2005, like 2006. Um, Which ones? Um so they are an unreleased pair. They are um, seamless. So they're like seamless Jordan, like tens. If you look up, and they're orange. Um, gosh, here, do you, can, can you hold on for a couple of seconds? Or yeah, still? no, of we can pause. Love to see for this. five thousand dollars Jays. We'll pause for an hour. <laughs> let's, see, let's see if I got them. I'm sure he does. <laughs> Wonder if he's got. You one. better have them. If you spent five racks on them, you you, you can't lose those ones. The man suspense, loves his shoes. The suspense and he, is and killing he loves me. Cars. I know. If you're hanging around Jordan, though, at the Ryder Cup, don't you think you can get you a little discount? Like, yeah, those retail for five, but give them to you for... I felt like it... We'll give them to you for 4900 I felt like he would show up in the Rolex parking lot with a different car every week. Yeah? Yeah. Change the whips up? He had a few. Yeah. He got good style. The suspense is I always me. had it. I, I want to see these seamless tents. What's Orange? Your, what's your, while we're, while we're here, your favorite pair of J's you have? That I have? Uh, I was always a huge 11 guy. Of course. Patent leather, huge. And I, and I like the, the Concords, yeah. Yeah, the the low top one dunks. I mean, can't have enough of those. Fair, low I'm ones or dunks, out. cannot have enough pairs of those. Uh, the threes were probably my, that was my first like pair of like yeah. nice ones that I ever got was the threes. And I, if you even 
put your foot next to me. I, there was only a few places you, I was like, I wasn't going to wear them to the bar. You know what I mean? They just get stepped on and they go to shit. So they had to be like, well, you can't wear them here in Scottsdale to the bars. They don't allow them. some of these places. Is, you can walk in with a tank top, but if you're wearing Jordans, like no, like, what, what kind of establishment are you running? Have I ever told Riff you my, my biggest flex ever with MJ? Was oh yeah. The, the FaceTime. Yeah. That was yeah. a good one. <laughs> we'll have to share that story. Someday. Oh, hold he's up, back. Oh, here he is. How much time? You oh, Never mind. How many closets you got, bro? Well, we're, we're in between. Um, huh? Yeah, we're recording. We're live. We're recording. <laughs> yeah, this is official. <laughs> no, we. I was. So we're we're uh, moving. So I've got like, I got one part garage, part closet here, and then I got my shoes kind of in another place. So we're just a mess. I'm gonna put it. I'll put it. Um, I'll send a picture to you guys so you can maybe put it. Yeah, send them. Pretty I need cool to see these bad boys. And I got so five grand. So the past. So the story was, I was with someone, a friend, and she was like, "You should get these because you're gonna meet Michael Jordan one day." He's gonna sign them. I thought you're crazy. It's so expensive. Like I was just a kid. Now she's like, you're gonna do it. And sure enough, I brought them to President's Cup. And when he was a captain, when Freddie invited him there, and he signed them. And wow. so, Ooh. yeah. So they're worth more than five grand now. Yes, they are. Yes, they are. And I showed him, and I and I showed him. It was funny. He he knew exactly what they were, and he knows about every single shoe that comes out um, through his brand. So it was. Um, it was a surreal moment, you know, being his, you know, growing up, watching him play and everything for him to be there and hang out with him that week during the President's Cup. Sur totally surreal moment. And um, he couldn't have been cooler. It was great. Might want to get tabs on those before you move. Maybe don't <laughs> no, leave that here, to the no, movers. They're here. They're As here. a man that just got robbed not long ago, you might not want to <laughs> leave that to the movers, dog. Just a little word to the wise, okay? I'm oh, shoeless. Hey, oh, I'm like yeah. shoeless sleaze Jackson. Yeah. Shoeless Sleaze Jackson. Yeah, they jacked all my J's. This is bastards. Uh, all right, next one. We're going to stay on the fashion fashion tip here, okay? Would it have been worth winning that 2002 USAM if you had to do it wearing the shirt that Ricky Barnes wore that day? <laughs> the uh, worst outfit in the history of golf? Horrendous. Horrendous. Well, Ricky always thought he was cooler than everybody else, so he, uh, <laughs> you know, he him, thought right? he could pull it off. He thought he could pull it off. It's it is what it is. He he won, so I don't want to be. Don't want to be better. I'm not better. No one's better. Did he have the Did they, he have the frosted tip? Oh yeah, dude. He was yeah, like was Eminem pretty, and Jimmy Buffett's love, love child. Time. Yeah, he didn't wear a hat. He wanted everyone to see the glory. Um, yeah, the glory. he was impressive that day. <laughs> Other than his clothes, he was impressive. Oakland Hills had that fire recently, and I got notified by a member yeah. up there who said, hey, you'll be happy to know Ricky's shirt actually made it out. And I was like, I don't think that's good news. <laughs> I think that was God trying to say this thing sucks. It's got to go. <laughs> that's pretty funny. Uh, I love it. All right. Next one. Um, some people might not know that Jordan Spieth actually bought your house in Dallas. True. So how would you rate his negotiating skills in the real estate market? Um, he left it to somebody else. Um, it was. Did you get him? Tell us you got him. I was yeah, very happy. I was like twenty five percent over be, market. I was very happy <laughs> okay. to sell the house to him. Very very happy. My wife was actually a big part of that. She was like, I think Jordan is a buyer house. I think he would. It's gated at that time. He was becoming an absolute superstar, and um, it, there's no privacy anymore. So people know where you live, and so it was getting a little weird for him. And so we we um, you know, my wife was actually a big part of that. She was the sales person in that situation so uh we were happy i think you should Everyone really overpay happy. for it <laughs> everyone is happy <laughs> okay good well it's a beautiful house by the way you did a great job designing that thing it's cool it's cool yeah it was it, it was, was really cool house yeah it was it was um fun to do and um um like i said everyone was happy <laughs> move wow. into this next house and then sell that one to them too 50 percent over market 50 percent over market yeah well we, i moved yeah, by this our window uh, all right, next one, because you're a part of a smash boy band group, the Golf Boys, dude. Oh, boy. Let's go back to the heyday of that thing. Let's assume you're all single individuals at the time. Which member do you think would have the hottest groupies, Ricky Fowler or Ben Crane? <laughs> <laughs> well, well that's a pretty easy answer there, Ricky. Crane. Pretty. Crane. Uh, oh, oh, yeah, yeah. Right. I mean, the bald, right? <laughs> bald is beautiful. Um, it is. Ben has been, yeah, bald, I think, literally since birth. I don't know if he's ever been yes. here. Um, he's always looked that way. But, um, you know, you can't you can't uh, teach sex appeal like that. You really can't. Any yeah. chance we get a reunion tour? I think, the, aren't, who is it? Is it the Backstreet Boys that are back doing something now? Uh, is, it, is it time? 
Um, that's a good question. Like during COVID, it seemed like people were really amped up mm-hmm. for it. They really wanted uh, us to do something again. Um, maybe. I, I never say never. That's definitely a model in my life. Just never know when things are going to come back around. Yeah. Keep those vocal cords warm. Get primed. Yeah. Well, yeah, for sure. For sure. All right. Next one. I want to go. I believe it was the 14th hole at Valhalla. You're playing an alternate shot match with Justin Leonard. Your caddy, John Wood, wants you to hit it in the middle of the green with a forearm, but you go against him, you go with three iron, and you stuff it to three feet. And the rumor is you walked off the tee and told John, you go, there's no way I wasn't going at that pin, MJ standing on the tee. <laughs> <laughs> I think there was... That is incredible that you did that. Yeah, I don't care I... about the match. MJ's here. I got to try to impress him real quick. Oh, for sure. Oh, for sure. I mean, I mean, it's so surreal when he's around, right? Like, it's he kind of sucks the air out of the room. Um you kind of have to impress him, right? How many opportunities do you have to do that? Um, but John would knew that, you know, great caddies know when to say no. They went, they know when to back off and say, <laughs> my player's got this. He's got this. But I remember, you know, playing the President's Cup when MJ was, you know, the assistant captain. I came off. I was playing Camillo. Um, I think I gave Camillo a putt. You know, it was early in the match. Kind of, you know, you're kind of nice at that time. And you're friendly. So I gave him a putt, and, I, and I'm, we're, I think I was one down through like three or something, and I'm walking off, and MJ just looked at me, and, and I mean, intense, like super intense, like he was playing or something. It's intense. He's like, don't give him that shit. Don't give him that shit. And he like slapped me in the ass. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm usually sorry, I'm I like to be calm when I play. And I'm like, John Wood, I'm like, I don't know. That was terrifying, but awesome at the same time. <laughs> I'm like, we can't lose this. We cannot lose this match. I am not going back to that clubhouse and having to look at him like, like just a straight loser. I said, I can't. We can't do it. We gotta. We gotta find a way to win, man. Sorry, Camilla. We're putting everything yeah, out. The rest Camilla, of the yeah, absolutely. Every, I mean, <laughs> finished, bud. You're pulling everything out of the hole. Don't even look at me. We're not. We're not talking anymore. It's time to go. Yep. I love it. Uh, Okay, next one. If someone moved to the U.S. from another country, okay, knew nothing about Oklahoma or Oklahoma State, how would you explain the difference between the two to them? One's awesome and one sucks. Um, Gosh, I mean, they're, you know, the good thing is I feel like we've actually grown, the university has grown together. I feel like actually Oklahoma's, um, greatness in so many sports. I mean, they just won the softball national championship. They won a ton of those. Football is unbelievable. Uh, the golf team, Ryan Hibble, friend, you know, a friend of mine I used to compete against some of his juniors, made their golf team awesome. Um, they are definitely the thoroughbreds, and we are, I mean, we are trying our best to get what we can. With golf and wrestling, we've been dominant for a really, really long time. Also, their golf team's great. Thanks, Ryan. But, um, but actually, I think their success has made us better. So I would say we're, you know, we're not the stepsister. We are related. And they just slightly better looking, just slightly better looking than, than we are. But not much. We're not, pick it up. We are related. We're totally, we're like twins, but just slightly better looking. You know, you always, you know, so they are. But they're, I was hoping for it, a little more hate, a little more hate. Like they're crazy. The, they have no teeth. Yeah. Well, no, that's, that's, read. that's Texas. <laughs> Texas is just the dumbest, yeah, yeah, okay. stupidest thing I've ever heard. Like, well, the color is right. Who wears that color? Why would you wear that color anywhere That's... except the game? It's gross. Yeah, now we're Stupid. going. Arch. They gave yeah. all about sucks. Texas. No one likes them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yep. Uh, what hurt? This is a bonus one. What What hurts more <laughs> worse when you lose to Texas or when Bill Haas got that ball up and down out of the water? Oh my god! To a championship. <laughs> I mean, the one year the lake's down. I mean, what I mean the so, oh my That's gosh! Crazy. Oh my god! <laughs> There's a foot of no water down there, dude. That <laughs> thing should be this... swimming. Go, I, I, you know, I want to see like a time lapse of history of that event over every single year. We go by that lake, right? And it's always up right up to the grass, except for one year when it's just like this massive drought. And it's just John Wood and I talked about it way back there. It's like, wow, there's it's really low this year. And then sure enough, we're like, I remember when Bill hit it over there, he hooked it over there, and I were standing in the fairway, like, oh my god, it's it gonna happen. Oh. We're, we're gonna win. We're, but I have a wedge. I've still got to hit the green. We got to make par, and I hit it right past the hole. Hit the hill, went back. So I'm, I've got twenty plus feet, but right where we need to be. And he just nips it right out of there and just and hits a little spin and hits it three feet. And we're still going on. We're like, 
it was like what a little happened? jarring. It was like, how did you do would that? Would you have he spun it out of the would, lake? Yeah, would you have won that. the FedEx Cup if you win the playoffs? Yes, that was a playoff. Hole. That was the first playoff. Hole. So that oh was Oh my god, that was like a yeah. ten million should, dollar mother nature. Yeah, Holy you should Venmo shit. request him like eight million dollars. Yeah, dude. Something. I'm not saying I deserve it all, but God, a piece of Bill, it. you bastard. I mean, it was, oh. um, it was a wild, it was pretty wild. It was pretty wild because, yeah, we were, that was it. I mean, that was it. And we were sitting in the fairway yeah. with a wedge in our hand, it, you know, down the middle on the green. All right. We're, you know, I was thinking he could splash it, hit it, and it's going to roll past the hole. I thought the best he could do is like 15 feet or so because, I mean, you got to hit it high. It's not like you just plop it on the green, you got to hit it straight up in the air. And because we didn't think he could put any spin on it. I mean, I've never seen anyone spin it out of the water like that. But I mean, kudos to him. It was an incredible shot, obviously. Yeah, it was. Global oh, warming my ass. Just robbed you. All right, last one. I'm guessing you've made a few investments throughout your life. Most of them probably being pretty successful. Where would you rank the $50 you paid me to not talk for an hour at Royal Oaks Country Club in your list of investments? That was a good one. I mean, I don't regret it. Right? <laughs> obviously. I mean, this is, I'm glad uh, you found your calling in life, which is to talk all the time. Uh, makes it that, That's sense. the moment I knew I should talk. It you makes told it me I need to shut up. I know. It's, we're trying to grind and practice. <laughs> is that all it takes is a fitty spot? I, mean, I was in college. I didn't have any money. <laughs> I know. Yeah, he was going to take it. It takes way. I sure changed yeah. myself. It takes way more than 50 now. Two hours. Yeah. Now you can charge. Now you got to charge people to not yeah. talk now because, you know, your voice and your face is your money maker. It's glorious. Face. Mostly face, we, some voice. Thank you for helping me find my calling. I Can I get my money back on that? Because if I helped you, you can help me. <laughs> i tell you what. I, I'll give you your 50 back if Bill gives you a little piece of that FedEx cup. Well, don't hold your breath. Yeah, I'd focus on Bill right now. I'd uh, focus on Bill first, if yeah. anything. Awesome, man. Well, Hunter, it's been an absolute blast, man. really appreciate it. Best of luck with whatever comes next, and hope to see you soon. Thank you, guys. Thanks for the opportunity. All right, well, that was Hunter Mahan joining us on Golf Subpar. So, is the dude, I mean, he was an absolute superstar in junior golf, college golf, came out on tour, made a lot of noise, played President's Cup, Ryder Cups, um, you know, was on that legendary team with Anthony Kim. The guy was an absolute stud, man. I, I'm really shocked he's hung it up this early, but, you know, if you look back to one moment in particular, it was that Ryder Cup over in Wales when he was, it all came down to him in that final match against Graham McDowell, whoever wins, wins the cup and you know he had the unfortunate loss there against Graham and I, I feel like that really affected him but man what a what a roller coaster ride it has been for Hunter Mayhem I mean the amount of pressure that's on one individual at a Ryder Cup and it all comes down to you and all their families out there and all the U.S. families out there all eyes are on you for it to be at that moment one guy that is a that's a tough one to have a moment like that on I thought it was really cool going to that you know after the Ryder Cup the interview where Phil Mickelson kind of jumped in when Hunter was getting emotional and things like that it was just that's a tough situation for anybody to be in especially if you're on the wrong side of it and like you said the guy has been a beast since junior golf I mean junior hands runner up at the USAM won everything in college got out on tour I mean he's been a stud and then all of a sudden it just shows what a fickle game this is man like he's a guy that that golf swing was textbook. He flushed it. Everything was right for him. And it just shows like there ain't nothing guaranteed in golf. I'm a little surprised with you that it's maybe, I'm going to say this early, but maybe that he's not, you know, going to continue to grind it out and go for a while, but he's had an unbelievable run. And if he doesn't love it and doesn't want to do it anymore, it sounds like he's not playing that much golf right now anyways, and doesn't miss it all that much. You don't got to do it. You don't got to go beat your head against the wall after you've had a career like that. He's been, he's, he's had a run, man. Yeah, he, he went on an incredible run, made a lot of money, obviously enough money to spend 5K on a pair of Jordans and pay me not to talk. I mean, what a guy. That's nice. That's nice. Since I'm over here, I, I put that same bet up there, Hunter. All right, well, it's time to step up to the tee and take a swing at betting the PGA Tour on the FanDuel Sportsbook. Right now, new customers can bet the tour with a no-sweat first bet. If you don't win, you'll get up to $1,000 back in free bets. Our favorite bets of the week last week, I believe you hit with a little birdie from Corey Connors on the last. And I just want to set the record straight real quick about mine. I took Tiger Woods to finish top 30. That was a betting with my heart, okay? I'm a fan. That was more of the fan just for something to root for out there. I got a little bit of hate about that. Listen, guys, I'm just here for the entertainment. I honestly thought Tiger would play well. I was really shocked. But the moment I saw the ball in the divot on the first hole and it went in the burn, I was like, oh, shit, we got a problem. Right yeah. out of the gates. It just... I mean, never could get it going. And we're looking to bounce back this week. And we aligned on Max Homa. We thought he would have a big week. By the way, we did not know at that time that he was going to be paired 
with Tiger Woods, which that's a pretty different arena to be playing in. So not making any excuses. I still love Max Homa's chances as we even after I saw he was paired with Tiger. Well, that's a different animal. And there are not a lot of guys that go out and get oh. with Tiger on Thursday, Friday, the first time and go light it up. Doesn't just doesn't happen much. Totally agree. I mean, here's Max obviously trying to, you know, get in contention in a major for the first time. His game is fantastic going in. And hey, by the way, you're going to be paired with Tiger Woods in the 150th Open Championship. Go enjoy. Yeah, the entire country of Scotland plus half the U.S. is going to be watching you. But shout out to Corey Connors for that little tweet on 18. I know uh, some of the listeners got on that, too. So how about my guy coming through clutch like that after a bogey on 17 too? hearted it out. All right. Well, you can use that no sweat first bet on top 20 finishes, head to head matchups, nationality props, whatever you want to do. Just make sure you go to the FanDuel Sportsbook and see for yourself why FanDuel is America's number one sportsbook. We're on to the 3M Championship, TPC Twin Cities. I'm going to be on the call this week for the Golf Channel. Um, field's not the greatest, but hey, you know what? Someone's going to win a shitload of money and someone's going to book a ticket to the Masters, Maui, all that stuff that comes with it. So. Let's get right to it. Let's get to the favorites. I'm going to go with a guy who had an absolute disastrous finish at the Barracuda Championship. I think he's going to be very motivated. I would not be surprised if he picks up his first PGA Tour win very soon. Why not it be in Minneapolis, the 3M Open? Maverick McNeely is going off at 20-1. to 1. The guy finished double bogey, bogey, bogey at Barracuda. So maybe a little a little red ass heading into, T, heading into 3M, and he's going to play well this week. Yeah, I saw that. I was watching that entire thing, waiting to see if Chez would close that out. He was up there. I was like, oh, don't count him out yet with some weirdness coming down the stretch. And then all of a sudden, I was like, where'd he go? And yeah, he's going to be pissed coming in there. I'm going to stay in that same range, Colt. I'm going 20 to 1. A guy that I got to see up close and personal for a few days at Colonial earlier this year, Davis Riley, who we've been high on all year. It's hard not to be. He's got six top 10s. Lost in, a, lost in a playoff earlier in the year at the Valspar. He was really close at Colonial to late on the back nine there on Sunday. It's just a matter of time for this dude. I think this is a, the type of field that I could see him going out and getting it done. No weaknesses in his game. Davis Riley, 20 to 1, as my fave. I actually really, really like him a lot this week as well. You, uh, I, I was talking to you before the show about who you liked. You said, I said, you know what? So do I. But when we align, sometimes things don't go that well. You so missed. Yeah. I went ahead and went another direction as far as a dark horse this pick has no merit whatsoever it's 65 to 1 has zero form but that's Good. what this guy does in his career this guy has the most up and down roller coaster career on the pga tour but he's a multiple time winner and his name is troy Merritt. 65 to 1 the dude's not scared to miss some cuts not scared to play absolute terrible and then go out and win so here we go troy Merritt. why not I love these picks with no research, no nothing. Just I got a gut feeling Troy Merritt rolls the shit out of the rock when he gets going. I ain't mad at it at all. I love those type of picks. I'm going to go with a guy uh, similar as Davis Riley, just getting out here, just starting to get some starts. His time's coming, and he's a just a recent guest on subpar, so that bump's got to be coming soon. Chris Goddard's going off at 45-1. to 1. He's had six starts on the PGA Tour, two top tens during that. Real close, fourth at the John Deere uh, just recently. Ain't afraid to make some tweets. And uh, I just think this dude is an up-and-coming monster. And this is the, just like I said with Davis Riley, this is the type of field where, where he could pull one off real quick. Well, stay tuned later in the week for our favorite bets of the week. We'll get that to you out on our social media pages. But download the FanDuel Sportsbook app and sign up using promo code SUBPAR to get started with your no-sweat first bet up to $1,000. FanDuel Sportsbook, official betting operator of the PGA Tour. Make sure you use code SUBPAR. Must be 21 years older and present in Arizona, Connecticut, Iowa, Illinois, New Jersey, New York, or Wyoming. First online real money wager only. Refund is non-withdrawable from free bets that expire 14 days after receipt. Restrictions apply. See terms at FanDuel Sportsbook.FanDuel.com. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLE or visit FanDuel.com slash RG in Iowa, New Jersey, or Illinois. 1-800-NEXT-STEP or text NEXTSTEP to 53342 in Arizona. 1-888-789-7777 or visit ccpg.org slash chat. Connecticut, one 877 8 hope and or text hope and why that's 467-369 in new york or 1-800-522-4700 in wyoming bam, bam. got it that's how you got do it. by the way i got a compliment about that read the other day on social media whoever that was thank you yeah you got that thing down nicely bud not gonna lie i wake up in the middle of the night hearing that shit it's ridiculous it's like the little dude that comes on after the boner pills on tv they gotta rattle off 800 <laughs> things that's like you you got a second job wait for you if you need it second i already got three that'd be four well, whatever get <laughs> i have up. enough Get in on those male enhancement pills after the commercial. It's perfect. All right, that's going to do it for us. We'll talk to you on next week's Golf Subpar.